Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Nixon Seminar on Conservative Realism and National Security, hosted by the Nixon Foundation. I'm Mary Kissel with Stevens Incorporated, formerly of the State Department. And we are honored to have Secretary Mike Pompeo and Ambassador Robert O'Brien co-chairing tonight's event. We're thrilled also to welcome back our distinguished seminar members and a new member, Bridge Colby, who is here this week. Our subject tonight is the Iran nuclear deal negotiations. But before we turn to that, we're going to start once again by addressing Putin's barbarous war on Ukraine, now in its sixth week. What have we learned about the West, about Vladimir Putin, and about nations like China? So, Secretary Pompeo, I wondered if you could kick us off. What have we learned about the intentions of the United States and our European allies? I think a lot of people are wondering, do we really want Ukraine to win? Over to you. Well, thanks, Mary. It's great to be with you all. Uh, you know, as for what we've learned, the first part of your question, I, I don't know that we've learned a, a heck of a lot, to be honest with you. Um, we knew Vladimir Putin was a bad guy, that he didn't be, uh, value human life. We knew the Ukrainians were tough people, probably learned that they were better and more capable, but frankly, with a lot of training and support that actually did come from the West, from the United States, who've been training their special operating forces for quite some time. Uh, we didn't learn much about Xi Jinping. We knew that he was simpatico with Vladimir Putin and that he too uh, was happy to watch Ukrainian kids be slaughtered if he could get cheap gas through a Russian pipeline. Uh, that, I don't think that's particularly newsy. Uh, your second question was, uh, do we want Ukraine to win, is I think how you phrased it. Um, lots buried in just the question there. Suffice to say, in the end, the Ukrainians will make a decision about what victory looks like. We should enable them to get as far and as fast as get them there as quickly as they're capable of getting. Uh, they haven't asked for a single American soldier, Marine, sailor, airmen. They haven't asked for our Space Force. They've just asked for the tools to defend themselves and their sovereignty. And uh, we were late. We were slow. We, we could do more even today. Um, but I, I have been heartened to watch Europe figure out that putting climate change at the top of their agenda was uh, a truly risky proposition. I pray they don't forget it when this moment passes. And I'd love to see the Biden administration learn the same darn thing if we did we could help the Ukrainian people and the people of Europe a whole lot more against these two twin uh, characters, Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin. Uh, I'll stop there, Mary. Okay, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Mr. Ambassador, uh, kind of unusually upbeat assessment there from the Secretary of State. Uh, what do you think that we've learned here? Um, are you too heartened by Europe's response? Well, the first thing I'll say, Mary, and, and I appreciate what my, Mike's comments, I certainly endorse them, uh, look at, but, but I think right now we're going through a heartbreaking period as we, as we watch the Ukrainians, these brave soldiers, uh, retake towns that have been occupied by the Russians and seeing the evidence of war crimes, the torture, the killing, the, the rape, uh, the, the wanton destruction of, of civilians. Uh, this isn't collateral damage. This is part of a, a Russian policy and it's heartbreaking. And so. You know, our, our, our prayers go out to the people of Ukraine as they, and we're going to see more of this as, as more towns are liberated. We're going to see what it means to, to have a Russian army uh, take over your town, take over your city, take over your country. Uh, we, yes, do we want to win? And, and if, we, if we want to win, we would put full sanctions on the Russians. Up until now, the sanctions have been half measures. We've excluded oil and gas sales from the SWIFT and the Russian Central Bank sanctions. And so by doing that, the only thing that Russia sells is oil and gas. The ruble is recovered. Uh, the, the Russian stock market is, is, part, is for the most part recovered. Uh, Russian oil shipments, I learned today, have, have for the most part recovered. The only thing they sell is oil and gas. So if we're not going to sanction oil and gas, there's not a lot of point to the sanctions. I mean, when's the last time anyone here went on Amazon and said, hey, I've got to get that newest thing from Russia, right? It's never happened because they don't sell anything other than oil and gas, maybe some minerals and some, some agricultural products. So we've got to put on full sanctions. We had an opportunity to do so today. The EU unfortunately fumbled and uh, they put on sanctions for coal three months from now. Uh, those, you know, the Europeans aren't importing a lot of coal anyway. And so <clears throat> it would have been nice to have seen Europe take the lead on oil and gas sanctions. Uh, number two, uh, we've got to be the arsenal of democracy. And, and uh, I remember being in Ukraine in 2014, uh, shortly after the, the Crimea invasion, and Ukrainians told me at the time the same thing that, that Secretary Pompeo just talked about. They didn't want American soldiers there, but they wanted the tools to defend themselves. 
And fortunately, in the Trump administration and under Secretary Pompeo's leadership and our team at the NSC, we were able to unclog the, the log jam and get those Javelin missiles that proved so critical in turning back the Russian invasion, at least around the, the Kiev region. We got those to the Ukrainians. We got them the training. Uh, the guys like Mike Waltz, special operators, uh, special forces guys were, were out training the Ukrainians. And so, so we did that. But enough already. We need to get them the MiGs. I mean, the, the, this whole charade of, of them not getting the MiGs and they're going to get flown to, to Germany. Look, if, if this was Mike Pompeo running the CIA, Mike would have had the MiGs to, to uh, Ukraine from Poland. They would have been painted in Ukrainian livery. He would have probably done it through a Russian arms dealer so that, that uh, Putin got his cut. And we wouldn't have known anything about it, but the, the Ukrainians would be enforcing their own no-fly zone over their own territory uh, with those MiGs instead of kind of the, you know, what, what we've seen uh, with this diplomatic fiasco. And the last point I'll just make is the same one that, uh, similar to what Mike talked about, Xi Jinping is watching this. And, and he's learning some lessons. And the number one lesson I think he's learning is that invading an advanced industrial democracy is hard. And hopefully he's taking that away. Hopefully he believes that the Taiwanese, and I think they will fight with the same uh, Elan and Esprit de Corps that the Ukrainians are fighting with. Uh, number two, he's seen the West uh, supply the, the Ukrainians, and hopefully he understands that the Taiwan will be resupplied in the same manner. And number three, he's seen the sanctions. And if we could get comprehensive sanctions on, the, the, the Chinese aren't ready to decouple from the world economy yet. And, and if he knows that comprehensive sanctions are coming against him, uh, if we could make that demonstration now against the Russians on Ukraine, it would be easier for the world economy to sustain. Uh, and and he, he believes that that would come to him and China and the Communist Party if they invaded Taiwan. That might be enough to deter him from going into Taiwan. So with that, I'll, I'll close my remarks. And uh, again, full sanctions, arsenal of democracy. Full sanctions, arsenal of democracy uh, from Ambassador O'Brien, uh, Secretary Pompeo heartened. Um, by the turn that we've seen in Europe away from climate change and toward um, a more serious look at their energy sources and their sources of defense. But the subject of China is an interesting one. Uh, Matt Pottinger, former Deputy National Security Advisor. Matt, um, the ambassador just laid out a positive case uh, that perhaps Xi Jinping is looking at this and saying, wow, look at the sanctions and um, look at the stalemate on the ground in Ukraine, but what if he's thinking, gosh, the oil and gas is still flowing to Europe and my economy's a lot bigger and goodness, Putin can't really run an army, but my army is much bigger, much more sophisticated. How do you interpret Xi Jinping and how he's behaving, not just what he's saying about Ukraine? Yeah, well, <clears throat> like Secretary Pompeo said, he's he is uh, backing Vladimir Putin, even though sometimes they send uh, deceptive signals suggesting that they're somehow on the fence or that they want to be a, a, a uh, you know a broker for peace. He's doubling down on Vladimir Putin because this is this is a culmination of a ten-year policy that Xi Jinping has been pursuing to to basically partner with the other revanchist, uh, aggrieved uh, you know diminished empire on you know that neighbors them and uh, and to help Vladimir Putin secure something that Vladimir Putin can hold on to and claim is some kind of a victory, which is why we shouldn't grant him that. We need to be giving Ukraine what it needs, not so that they can maintain a stalemate or some kind of a frozen conflict. We should be giving them what they need to achieve victory and, and, and a decisive victory against the Russians. Now, Xi Jinping, um, to Ambassador O'Brien's point, uh, you know, invading an island through amphibious operations is a lot more complicated than driving tanks across a border from Belarus or Russia. And we saw how, how that easier scenario went for the Russians. So if I were a Chinese war planner, I'd be sweating right now and revisiting a lot of my assumptions about how easy a war might be. Uh, but, the, you know, and, and by the way, the urban warfare component of that, right? The Battle of Kiev, at least the first Battle of Kiev, has been won by a, a bunch of scrappy uh, uh, defenders against, uh, against Russia. So th there needs to be um, a lot of lessons that are being applied rapidly in Taiwan. And while it's hard to invade an island, it's also really hard to resupply an island uh, if a war begins, which means we need to supply Taiwan now with everything they need, all the training that they need. It doesn't need to be high profile, but it needs to be comprehensive and in-depth uh, poor Congressman Waltz. We, you know, let's send uh, him and and his former uh, 
uh, uh, colleagues in the, in, the, in the Green Berets to go train uh, uh, people how to fight in Taiwan because the fight may not end at the beaches. They need to show that they're able to fight in the cities and as well as in the mountains and, uh, and in the countryside. Well, that is one of the things that we have learned now six weeks into this Ukraine conflict, that logistics matter. And thankfully, we've got the guy who wrote the book, literally, on Taiwan and the strategy of denial, Bridge Colby. He's a new seminar member. Um, Bridge, uh, talk to us a little bit, uh, re just react to Matt's comments, but uh, also tell us how much we're learning about the import of Ukraine and defending Ukraine six weeks in. Sure. Well, thanks, Mary. And let me just say it's an honor to be part of this distinguished group chaired by uh, Secretary Pompeo and Ambassador O'Brien, really, and, and President Nixon's legacy is certainly uh, on, my, on my mind. So I think uh, it's really a, a privilege to be a part of this important group. So thanks. I think, you know, I associate myself with the comments before. What I would emphasize, Mary, is a key lesson that I think is being neglected a little bit here is that sanctions and international condemnation like play a role. But what's really happening is that the Ukrainian I mean, to me, maybe maybe every every uh, you know to a hammer everything is a nail, but it shows denial. I mean, my view is that Vladimir Putin and his forces would be at the Polish-Romanian border if it were merely a matter of sanctions and international condemnation, but rather it's the it's the Ukrainians, it's the training that Secretary Pompeo uh, mentioned and he led, and and uh, it was such an important uh, part of this uh, mix, uh, and you know who el who knows what else is going on in the intelligence world. But I think this is a critical thing. And I think Matt is right that there, you know, PLA planners are going to take uh, pause. But bear in mind that China's 10x the Russian economy. Uh, they're also going to learn from the Russian failures. I mean, if I'm a PLA planner, I say to myself, I take no risk at the beginning of this. I flatten every potential target. I take out everything. I don't let some clever plan of maybe decapitating Zelensky interfere or Tsai, in this case, interfere. And I think what, what Matt is suggesting about the critical importance that Taiwan, I mean, I think the window is really closing. I mean, I, you know, Admiral Davidson has talked about this window. We are, from a defense planning point of view, we are already well within that window. In fact, there are things we probably can no longer do in the near term. So I think we are at a point, and this is a, a, a real a problem with the administration's defense budget that just came out. I mean, you have a president talking like we're in the, you know, in the midst of World War II, battle between democracy and autocracy, and then you get a defense budget that looks like business as usual, that's maybe above inflation if we're lucky, and, and none of the changes that we really, or very few of the changes we really need to see. So I think you know, this decade has already gotten really hairy, and I think it's likely to get, unfortunately, more hairy. So lessons on uh, the cohesion in Europe, uh, lessons for the US defense budget, ramifications for China, um, just want to go to Nadia Shadlow here, um, former Deputy National Security Advisor and also one of the primary authors of the National Security Strategy. So she's thought a lot about these issues. Nadia, um, what lessons do you take away from Ukraine and what we've seen over these last weeks? Thanks, Mary. It's great to be here. And I agree with, I think, every, everything that's been said. I just want to highlight uh, one point that hasn't been made about lessons that might be might seem tactical, but I think actually is quite strategic, is, is our miscalculation in some ways about the capabilities of the Russian military. Now, that's not having said, I think actually I'm one of the people that thinks that we still have things, uh, we will still see possibly Russian cyber actions, that we shouldn't pat ourselves on the back. But having said that, I think uh, we have seen um, the incredible difficulty of joint operations, right? Of bringing together all of these, of the army, of, of the army, of the air force, um, of bringing it all together into a way that achieves strategic objectives. It's really hard to do. And so to Bridges' point and to Matt's point about what the Chinese are learning, what worries me is that they're seeing this as well, right? And this has been a potential weakness of really all militaries. The Americans are exceptionally good at this because of the way we train. But I think it's really important uh, to, to keep this in mind down the line because I think our adversaries will learn from this and understand how important it really is to get this right in this incredibly complex military environment. So there's so, so many important angles here to discuss. We have so little time. I want to get as many people in as possible. Uh, Kim Reed, uh, former chair of the uh, Export Import Bank. Kim, uh, over to you. So. Uh, 
Great to be with all of you. I've spent uh, earlier today uh, time at the Transatlantic Energy Security Forum, where I heard uh, firsthand from ambassadors and representatives from Latvia, the Czech Republic, uh, the Slovak Republic, Estonia, um, uh, about how much they really want to be having United States energy exports. So we focused on that. Uh, Senator Manchin and Senator Cassidy um, joined us and it just really underscored what Secretary Pompeo and Ambassador O'Brien started on the need for US um, uh, uh, economic security in Europe. And uh, I'm feeling um, that finally the world is realizing this. And uh, I just want to underscore uh, something that the representative from the Czech uh, Republic uh, said today, and that is, if uh, Ukraine goes, we're next. So just want to say that there's a uh, big interest in buying American energy, and I hope that um, it's awful what's happening, but I really hope that uh, the world wakes up to the value that our country provides uh, to the world. Well, it's a great point. Um, it does take time to build energy infrastructure, but we have seen some U-turns in particular uh, out of Germany saying that they will build more LNG out of the United Kingdom saying that they will tap some of their uh, carbon resources, which is a great sign. Uh, I don't know if we'll see the East-West uh, Mediterranean pipeline restarted. I don't know if we'll see a loosening of regulations here in the United States. So uh, let's go to somebody who knows what's going on policy-wise and in the halls of Capitol Hill, Representative Mike Waltz um, just want to bring you into the discussion here again. Uh, we're talking about Putin's war in Ukraine and what we've learned so far before we turn to the Iran nuclear deal. Sure. Uh, Congressman, um, react a little bit to, to all the angles here that you've heard. Uh, what have you learned to date? Well, you know, this is this has actually been one of the times where I'm 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 proud of Congress, uh, <laughs> and I think Congress has played a, a constructive role here. Uh, dragging this administration along in many ways, and it's been a bipartisan role. Uh, everything from a, a whole series of congressional delegations last year, uh, the one I was on um, with, with four Democrats and, and three Republicans, we were uniform last year uh, in saying that the sanctions should have been in place then, uh, that the Ukrainians should have had stingers counter-battery radar, harpoon anti-ship missiles, and other more sophisticated weapons that they needed then. Uh, the, the, the frustration of even the embassy uh, last year and the Ukrainians uh, on the foot dragging from the administration with the premise that uh, they didn't want to be too provocative from, uh, towards Putin, they didn't want to be too escalatory. And I think one of the things in terms of a lesson, and we had a very very healthy uh, and heated at times back and forth with both General Milley and Secretary Austin today uh, at the Armed Services Committee on whether deterrence failed. And I think we need to acknowledge and be clear-eyed that the administration's deterrence strategy did fail uh, and that integrated deterrence, which is a new favorite buzzword uh, that, that we're hearing a lot in Washington, also failed, yet we're seeing integrated deterrence as a key component in uh, the new national defense strategy. So I think we need to understand that a uh, economic diplomatic focused um, strategy for deterrence didn't work. I don't know that it would work. I think it would be even tougher when it comes to Taiwan and that many on the left are using that frankly as a cover to move away from hard power. Uh, and and you know, lesson number two is hard power matters. Uh, and dictatorships, particularly those like Putin, will push and push and push till they meet hard steel, period. Uh, and fortunately, belatedly, we're now putting that in the hands of the Ukrainians. Um, and I think that this is the final thing in, in acknowledging, I mean, finally, we had the NATO commander, uh, General Walters, this week acknowledge publicly that Ukrainians probably could have performed better. Their cities may be in better shape. There may be fewer refugees and sadly, uh, uh, dead and, and wounded Ukrainians if they had had stingers on day one and they had had this equipment uh, on day one with the, with the training um, uh, behind it. So I think that's the biggest lesson uh, that we need to continue to press 
uh, and learn from. And then finally, just one, one comment, somebody mentioned uh, the budget. You know, we had the, the comptroller of the Pentagon uh, uh, admit today that he used a 4% inflation figure uh, in this budget. When we're talking $800 billion budget, uh, a three to 4% delta is literally tens of billions of dollars that we're going backwards. I mean, they even went so far as to kind of pat themselves on the back for a 4% pay raise for the troops. So they're, by my math, they're going 4% backwards uh, in terms of even the, you know, the, the incentives we have for retention and, and recruitment. Um, and we won't even, I know I'm going to, I know I'm going to light um, Ambassador uh, um, uh, O'Brien up on, on the Naval, uh, the Navy's budget uh, on this, but you know, you cannot convince me that nine ships sometime in the future are going to replace 24 ships of capability that we're decommissioning. Uh, and when you see the trend lines in uh, the, China, the PLA Navy, uh, the PLA Space Force, uh, their nuclear modernization, and you see ours, um, we, you know, Bridge Colby's right, we're out of time. Uh, the Pentagon budgets on a five-year cycle. Well, if you buy into Admiral Davidson's window of 2027, and I do, uh, from from all the the briefings that we're receiving, that's one five-year budget away. That means what we're buying right now is what we have, uh, and it is wholly, completely uh, insufficient. So I think with that that <laughs> happy, depressing <laughs> um, uh, input. Uh, we have a lot to learn from from this um, uh, from this tragic invasion, and I'm not sure that we're we're learning it, and we certainly aren't applying it in this budget. Well, we we have to get on to our main topic tonight, the Iran nuclear deal negotiations. But before we do, um, Ambassador O'Brien, any final thoughts on this topic before we move on? Well, the only thing uh, because. Waltz, you know, wound me up as he, he knew he would. Uh, we're we're going we're, we're, we're to inflict, we've got a self-inflicted Pearl Harbor taking place in this budget. We're going to lose more ships in this budget, and many of the ships are, are new, or, or they're like our Ticonderoga-class cruisers that, have a, that are the most feared warships by the PLA Navy because they have 120 vertical launch cells and could be extended for, for a relatively, uh, for, for 20 years for a relatively small amount of money. And, and we're going we're gonna to lose all those ships, more ships than we lost in Pearl Harbor in this budget. I mean, it, it makes no sense whatsoever. Secretary exactly. Pump, Secretary Pump, any last thoughts, Mr. Secretary? No, uh, let's, uh, let's, get to, let's get to Iran. We, you should know that these are deeply connected. I'm glad we're going to do them sequentially. But thanks for actually calling me optimistic. That's the first time in a long time. <laughs> well, there's a time and a place for everything, Mr. Secretary. <laughs> Um, so we will turn now uh, to what was advertised, which is uh, the renegotiation of the Obama era Iran nuclear deal. Here's President Richard Nixon on the topic of Iran. Let's roll that tape. The uh, Shah is, is generally uh, accepted as having been a very repressive and oppressive ruler. His uh, Savak uh, tortured and killed. Uh, he lived in considerable uh, splendor and opulence while there was uh, terrible poverty in his country. In your book, uh, Leaders, you write that uh, he was not ruthless enough in quashing those who threatened his nation's stability. Do you think he should have been more ruthless? Yes, I do, uh, particularly in view of the fact that his opponents uh, were not those who were basically more liberal, but because basically they were reactionary. They were the true reactionaries. Let, let's look at the Shah for just a moment and look at him very fairly. He actually was a progressive, uh, a progressive in a number of ways. Uh, he instituted a land reform program. Uh, he instituted a literacy program. He sent thousands of students from Iran to uh, the United States, and particularly the United States, to study and in other countries as well. Uh, he liberated women. The irony was that those he liberated, the women, uh, and the students he sent abroad, they came back and joined the revolutionary forces. And the irony was that the Shah, being progressive, was attacked as being reactionary and conservative on these particular issues, whereas his opponents were the reactionaries. Putting it very bluntly and very simply, 
The Shah was trying to move Iran into the 20th century. His opponents, Khomeini et al., wanted to move Iran back into the Dark Ages, and that's what they've done. Now there was some repression, true. Now there is total repression. Uh, there may not have been enough land reform. Now there is none whatever. Uh, what I am simply suggesting is this, that when we look at the Shah, we have to look at him in terms of what he confronted. And he, can turn it, he confronted revolutionary forces there that were not working, in my view, for what was best for Iran and certainly not best for ourselves. And most important from the United States standpoint, instead of having a friend in Iran, we now have one that is not only not a friend, but one that is, considers us to be the great Satan. So that was Richard Nixon there, uh, unfortunately, describing a situation I mean, in Iran uh, that we still confront today with revolutionaries in charge of that country, still repressing the Iranian people, still considering America and Israel the great Satans. Um, Ambassador O'Brien, I know you have to, to leave us a little bit early tonight, so I want to go to you first. Um, the choice that President Nixon was describing was a choice between uh, something that was not great, the Shah was a very repressive figure, but the choice in some respects between bad and worse, the Shah or the revolutionaries. Um, are there ever really these clear choices in foreign policy? Um, what did you make, and please react to President Nixon's comments. Well, look, I think uh, Dick Nixon, President Nixon showed again with that clip, uh, his prescience in international affairs, and, and, and we need more Dick Nixons today. So I, I'm glad we're doing this program and, uh, and we're bringing some realism to U.S. foreign policy. And I, I think his, his comments can be applied to the JCPOA. And so if you take a look at the JCPOA, the first JCPOA, it was built on lies. And those lies have now been exposed to be uh, totally exposed and, and the, the deal was a sham. The, the, the lie was, if we give the Iranian regime, the Ayatollahs, uh, if we give them 150 billion in sanctions relief, then they'll become a, re a responsible stakeholder in the Middle East and, and the middle class in Iran will flourish. What, what actually happened is the Iranian regime took that money and they spent all of it on a combination of terrorism for the Houthis, Khatib Hezbollah, Hezbollah in Lebanon, Hamas, and other groups, and so and destabilize their neighbors. Uh, they said they weren't going to take any more hostages. As soon as they let the three American hostages go at the end of the JCPOA, they took more hostages that, that Mike and I had to try and, and get out. We, got, we were able to get a number of them out, fortunately. Uh, they, their nuclear program, which they said they never had a nuclear program, was totally exposed by Mossad and the Israelis uh, when they, they captured the archives and, and Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, gave the world access to the Iranian nuclear archives. And then the, the Iranians used that period of time during the JCPOA where, where even if they technically complied with it, they used the time to build ICBMs and delivery uh, mechanisms for the bombs that they would eventually have when the JCP, JCPOA sunsetted and then they could marry up the, and then they became a recognized nuclear power. And so, you know, the, the, the whole thing made no, no sense for the Iranian people, for the American people, or for the world. Now we're talking about doing a JCPOA 2 that has all of the same flaws and, and yet has a shorter sunset period than, than, now that we've moved along. And, and, and what I'm predicting now, uh, and this is something we've all talked about, and Secretary Pompeo has talked about it as well, we're going to have a nuclear proliferation event in the Middle East like we've never seen, because if we think that the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is going to stand by when the Iranians get their nuke in a couple of years when the JCPOA sunsets, or we think the UAE or we think Turkey or Egypt are all going to stand by and allow the Iranians to be a nuclear power in the Middle East without them in turn either developing their own program or buying the nukes from Pakistan. You know, that that's fantasy land. We're going to have, in the most volatile part of the world, we're going to have a massive nuclear proliferation because of this deal. What we, should, what we need to do is go back to maximum pressure where we were with with the Trump administration, where you were involved in that, Mary and others on the on the on the call, uh, Mike and, and Nadia and others, and, and we need to we need to shut down this this nuclear program in Iran once and for all. Well, thank you for that, Mr. Ambassador. I, I know you have to jump off, so thank you for for joining us tonight. It's always great for you to be with us, uh, Secretary Pompeo. Um, you were very intimately involved, perhaps more than anyone else in the Trump administration, on Iran policy. 
uh, both from your time as director of the Central Intelligence Agency to your time as Secretary of State. Uh, and you, in fact, made a speech uh, explaining um, why the United States should not continue with the deal. But for those folks who are watching this maybe for the first time or don't follow Iran that closely, um, can you explain why it would be a bad thing to delay Iran's nuclear program for a couple of years? Isn't a couple of years to play devil's advocate better than nothing? Over to you, Mr. Secretary. Yes, well, um, every minute without them having a program is a good minute, but the price to be paid connected to that is absolutely staggering for the United States, for Israel, for states throughout the Middle East as well. You, um, you hearken back to remarks that I gave in May of 2018. I, I remember the response from the world. Um, I laid down 12 conditions. These are the things we asked the Iranians to do, and I equipped I, I quipped that it's not a single thing in that list of 12 that we don't ask the Norwegians to do. Right. These and yet the progressive left uh, and most of the Democrat Party said these are outrageous demands. Things like not committing acts of terror, not taking Americans hostage, uh, engaging in world trade, not threatening our friend and ally Israel. Just simple things. Uh, and yet this was a bridge too far for the Iranian regime uh, to give them to give them these resources, this money in exchange for. Uh, the potential that we delay their program just a little bit is a, a uh, is not truly a deal. It's a it's a really bad outcome. Uh, you know, Robert walked through this in some detail, but it was really important to remember uh, the things we were prepared to do. When I was listening to Richard Nixon talk, he spoke with more candor than most leaders do. Maybe it was because he was out of office by this point, but he was he was prepared to acknowledge that he was making friends with some characters that were a bit rough. I, I remember when uh, Jamal Khashoggi perished in the uh, the consulate in Turkey, we understood where America's interests lay. We, we knew that if we did this right, we could put enormous pressure on the Iranian regime. We could support the Iranian people and their efforts at freedom. We could make friends with the, the nations in the region that were trying to get it more right every day, nations like the Emirates and like the United Arab Emirates nations, right? They're tr trying to get it right, the Saudis, right? Making making real progress by by some standards that you could you could shoot arrows and say oh, it's not enough you could look at egypt and say it's not enough but trying to make real progress i mean for goodness sakes cc went to a, a a coptic christian ceremony on christmas day that's the egyptian president guy yeah, sorry the egyptian president cc on, on the coptic christian church in cairo on on christmas day um we we need to be realistic about the folks who aren't trying to kill Americans, aren't trying to undermine the United States of America, are friends with our friends like Israel and not sidle up to the Iranians. Every billion dollars that we provide to them is $980 million more that is likely to go into their terror program or their nuclear program, each of which will be, enable them to hold America more at risk. Well, speaking of President Nixon and that sort of candor and, and realism, realism that we want to bring in this group to U.S. foreign policy today, I think we do have a second clip of the former president speaking about Iran. If we've got that, let's cue up that second video clip. Can you say that if you had stayed in office that you would not have allowed the shot to fall? I would not have, no. Uh, I would have been steadfast throughout. Uh, I would have made it very clear down through the bureaucracy that we're, there was to be absolutely no c contact with uh, those that were trying to overthrow him. Uh, I would have had a very good uh, study made of Khamenei's background and would have found that uh, exactly what kind of person it was because by studying his background they could have known that he was going to do exactly what he's going to do. Uh, the man uh, is a radical reactionary. He's not a progressive in any sense of the word. If you had been See, the choice basically was not between the Shah and somebody better. The choice was between him and somebody worse. And it's very easy for me to make that choice. If you had been confronted with the worst case from that point of view, and the Shah had been overthrown, uh, and hostages taken, and you were president, would you have taken him into the United States? Absolutely. I would have taken him into the United States, and as far as the hostages are concerned, I would have handled that a little differently, too. Uh, I don't say this in criticism of President Carter, because he certainly uh, went through a lot on the hostage situation. He believes it may have cost him the election. I don't think it did. I think the economic issues were the major ones. But be that as it may, it didn't help him. 
But as far as the hostage issue, uh, situation was concerned, American foreign policy can never be made hostage to hostages. That's why hostages are taken, for purposes of blackmail. And we mustn't let that happen. And for example, the, when President Carter was asked about the hostage situation, he went overboard in saying that our first and then only concern was the safety of the hostages. Now, that is a concern, but our major concern is what happens to Iran, what happens to the relations between the United States and Iran. And in this respect, I would never have said, as President Carter did, that I rule out the use of force in order to get the hostages back. All that did uh, was to encourage those that had captured them and were holding them in captivity uh, not to give them up. Jonathan Burks, you heard President Nixon say there, I would not rule out the use of force. We've just confronted this uh, with Ukraine, with President Biden saying repeatedly, I will not put troops on the ground, saying it publicly. And now uh, with the Iran nuclear deal, we're, we're also signaling the opposite, that we, we don't want to exert pressure. We want uh, to give them cash and inducements uh, to sign a piece of paper with us. What do you think of that? strategy. Yeah, it's obviously uh, self-limiting. And so the uh, lesson we should be taking from our experience in Ukraine is that our ability to act is dependent in a lot of ways on uh, the strength that we have as a nation uh, independent of uh, other nations and uh, the ability to bring other nations along with us by strengthening their ability to act independent of, of the, the threat. And so, you know, one of the things that we really should be working on both in Ukraine and, and in the Ukraine context, is how do we uh, husband our strengths by increasing energy independence, by reducing um, economic dependence of our allies on, um, on Iran, and how do we help our allies in the region and elsewhere uh, feel more secure, uh, absent uh, a solution to the Iran uh, problem? So I, I think it, it's fanciful to think that there's a negotiated solution um, that's uh, just in the offing if we're just a little, we're a little bit more patient. And so we really ought to be thinking about how do we uh, isolate and play a longer, uh, take a longer view and a longer strategy on Iran uh, that doesn't involve um, either the use of force or a negotiated uh, surrender uh, that only in, uh, endangers allies and, and our own interests. Well, that's a, a very interesting question. If you don't like the policy that the Biden administration is putting into place, um, but you don't want to put troops on the ground. Is there some sort of middle road here? How might we think about that? Uh, I don't know if we've got some, some volunteers here uh, from the seminar that want to tackle that question. If you don't, I'm just going to call on you. Um, actually, Mike Waltz, uh, you're a sitting congressman. You have to answer these tough questions all the time. Um, you know, we've tried uh, President Obama's way. The Biden administration is continuing that. We tried maximum pressure. It did have success, um, but the Iranians still continued to maintain their nuclear arsenal and still kept, you know, fomenting terror around the region. I mean, is there a strategy that's kind of in the middle? That's kind of what Biden is trying to do on Ukraine. Is there a way there to do it on Iran? Yeah, that's a. I mean, that's that's the sixty-four million dollar question, Barry, and, and your. Your questions will never be tougher than a standing before a town hall of, of 400 of, uh, of our great American citizens. But yeah, I just we just received a, a series of briefings from the negotiators, uh, from Rob O'Malley, uh, Brett McGurk, and, and, and others. Um, and, and, you know, the disconnect there is on the one hand, um, they're, they're saying that maximum pressure didn't work. Um, but on the other hand, they kind of later in the briefing say because of the pressure, the economic pressure, the Iranians are at the table and ready to make a deal. Then they go back to, well, it didn't work. Uh, but then they go back to we can do even tougher sanctions if we really want to. When we ask and many members ask what happens if if you know they walk away from this deal and we have no deal. Um, and the reply was, well, we have a whole menu of far tougher sanctions that could really um, get to them back to the table, which leads me to wonder why those aren't in place uh, and why we didn't continue those. The fact is, I think we've loosened uh, some of the pressure, uh, particularly vis-a-vis -vis, uh, reserves in South Korea. 
um, uh, in terms of some of the secondary pressures that we were putting on both Europeans uh, and China. Uh, I, I think there's a number of things that we could do. Um, the thing that the regime cares about the most, sadly, isn't its own people, is its wallet. Uh, and the vast um, business empire that the IRGC and others um, in, in the regime have been running and enriching themselves on um, for years. Uh, I also don't think we should be even at the table uh, while the regime is holding uh, four Americans hostage, uh, literally. Um, and one was, by the way, Samiak Namazi, uh, a case that the secretary knows well, was left behind by the Obama administration on the last deal, despite promises from Zarif to Kerry that he would be released and his poor father went over to see what he could do and he was taken hostage as well. Um, so I think there needs to be some important preconditions. Um, and, and I think there's a lot more we could do in terms of economic pressure uh, that could influence the regime's um, behavior. And there's a lot more we could do vis-a-vis -vis Qatar uh, and some of, its, uh, some of the others that the Iranian regime leans on. And finally, let me just say from a congressional standpoint, um, you know, I led a, a bipartisan letter last year, and it's important to keep reminding folks that 70 Democrats signed on uh, to this letter to the president uh, and to the secretary that any future deal has to be wider, uh, deeper, and stronger. It has to include terrorism, hostages, ballistic missiles, and a true verification regime uh, that includes military sites and doesn't include notification months and months uh, in advance. Uh, and really that also, that, that letter was intended for the markets in that Congress isn't going to honor this, a future administration isn't going to honor it. Uh, and therefore every dollar that German or French or other companies think they can invest uh, into the regime uh, will be put at risk and they need to think twice. What I'm most concerned about in the current negotiations are what's being termed inherent guarantees. Basically, uh, you know, the, the regime is concerned, knows that, that the, the administration isn't going to bring it to Congress, won't have the full force of a treaty. A future administration can back out of this deal. And essentially what the inherent guarantees um, say is that if a future administration does walk away uh, for a variety of very good reasons, that uh, many of the behaviors will snap right back into place in terms of enrichment, centrifuges, uh, and other things. And I think any effort to, to tie a future administration's hands uh, is, is just wholly and completely unacceptable and something we have to watch out for. We certainly do. So many great points there, Congressman. Thank you very much. It also uh, raises a question, which is the bipartisanship that we saw on China on Capitol Hill has now been extended to Russia. And you wonder if we're going to see Congress now also agree that we need a tougher stance on Iran policy. Who would have thought that that would have been possible even only a couple of years ago? Bridge Colby has raised his hand. I also, just Bridge, real quick, I also want to welcome Chris Cox, who is, uh, Christopher Cox Nixon, who has joined the seminar. Chris, it's great to see you. I'm coming to you in a second. Get ready. Great. Bridge, <laughs> Bridge, you wanted to weigh in here uh, on Iran. Over to you. Sure. Thanks, Mary. I was going to pick up on something that actually Secretary Pompeo was talking about that also related to one of the clips that President Nixon was talking about. And I think this is the point about how we engage with foreign leaders and foreign governments. And I think there's a really key point here. I mean, we've seen, in a sense, over the last 15, 16, whatever months, um, the results of, I mean, frankly, it's a bit of a rerun to some of the Carter foreign policy, the early Carter foreign policy, very highfalutin kind of moralistic rhetoric. Uh, which ends up being completely abandoned upon need. And then you have the predictable results uh, with the Emiratis and the Saudis and others, which is, well, I mean, if you're going to lash us over, you know, with coals or whatever, uh, then we're not going to uh, do you a solid when you ask for oil. And to the contrary, they're, uh, you know, pricing some of the, the Saudis are pricing some of their oil sales in Juan. And of course, the Indians are doing various things and countries are acting in their interests. Well, the point of a conservative realist foreign policy, I mean, it was interesting to see President Nixon talking, I mean, he's talking about using the word progressive, it had a different connotation at the time, but he was not saying that he liked 
the Shah's methods, he was saying, okay, the world's a tough, imperfect place. And I think that, you know, very much like his mentor, President Eisenhower, and I think President Reagan continued this, the Kirkpatrick doctrine, is the world's an imperfect place. You know, so let's be consistent. And the best way for freedom, certainly our interests, but also freedom to flourish in the world is for America and its allies and partners to be strong. And some of those allies and partners are not going to be pretty. I mean, President Nixon and President Eisenhower had to deal with that reality. President Reagan, you know, with Ferdinand Marcos or Central America, you know, you go, you, you, you could go on. Um, but the point wasn't to, to laud that or applaud that, but to, as Secretary Pompeo was saying about President Sisi, you're going to get a better result for people who are aligned with us over time, you know. And the, the, the sort of the sorry thing about the alternative approach is you've got Secretary Blinken and the president talking about how evil these you know countries are and how they're inconsistent, and then going and asking them for favors. And it's like, well, at least be consistent, you know. And it's not even it doesn't even work. And so, I mean, I think one thing that I really would take in this context, and I think it's particularly relevant in the Middle East, is you know it's not the unipolar era anymore. It's a tough era. I mean, I think we all, most of us, served in the Trump administration. I think the big thing that that Nadia and others and Matt. Involved this is great power competition model. The basic idea: China is the priority there. Russia is still a huge problem, as we've seen. But we can't just do anything we want. We can't just solve everything magically. We got to prioritize. We got to focus. We got to make hard calls, and we all differ exactly on how to do that. But the reality: we're dealing with a tough world where we can't just snap our fingers. And in that context, and I think in particular in the Middle East, but also in Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, you know, as Secretary Pompeo was saying, you you got to have a long term plan. You build relationships. You you work things to get better. But you're looking after long-term coalitions where there's an understanding. And I think that's something that we've seen. And, you know, the Iran deal, I mean, one of the many problems that I see with it is like the people that we actually need. And, you know, the Emiratis are playing footsie with the Chinese and the, and the Saudis are as well. That doesn't mean that we should just, you know, do whatever they want, of course. But we're going to need to, you know, as my partner and many, many of you know, my, my great friend, Wes Mitchell, I mean, he's, we got to compete for influence. And I know Secretary Pompeo, that's the point you used. I mean, this is the kind of thing, well, that means being smart and being strategic in how we deal, even with governments that we don't, we don't admire how they, uh, you know, their, their political regime. Um, I'm just going to go quickly to Matt Pottinger on the China point, since, uh, Bridge, you, you raised the, the Saudi-China relationship. Um, you know, how important is China to the region? They're also a party uh, to the Iran nuclear talks. They were the first time around. They are this time around. Um, you know, judging on our experience in government with Beijing, they were never good actors. They think of us as an enemy. Um, how do you treat them in this equation as part of these talks? Do you try to influence them? Do you try to undermine them? I mean, uh, how, do you, how do you view that dynamic? Well, you know, to Bridges' point, <clears throat> if we, uh, when the Biden administration had come in, if it had simply picked up where the Trump administration left off with the Abraham Accords, I mean, what, a, what an amazing accomplishment that was, right? We, 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 we leave in place uh, peace agreements for the first time in a, in a quarter century between Arab, uh, Sunni Arab states and, uh, and uh, Israel, which is, which is also the beginning of a security construct, right? So that, that's our ticket to being able to focus more resources on East Asia, where Bridge rightly points to China as the, as the, the mothership, you know, that's the that's the primary adversary that is a lifeline to Iran. It's a lifeline to North Korea, to, to Vladimir Putin, to Venezuela. So, so we, we've undermined our own priority by turning our backs on our Arab uh, partners in the region and, uh, and, and trying to cut a, a, you know, an unwise deal with, uh, with the Ayatollah. Um, Look, I, this Xi Jinping and um, and uh, Taiwan, uh, to Bridges' earlier point as well, we're in that window of danger now, right? It's not it's not sort of like well, in a few years it could get really uh, r really rough. We're in the window of danger where Xi Jinping may choose to act, and. Uh, to Bridges' point about some of the lessons the Chinese may be learning, in addition to the fact that they should be re reassessing some of their assumptions about how easy a war would be, they're also probably, or quite possibly at least, thinking that, geez, if they're going to go go in, they're going to go in big. They're not going to salami slice this thing. The way that, in, in essence, Putin had his little green men back in 2014 taking Crimea, and then he, then he moved into the Donbass. 
uh, you know, Xi Jinping may be, may be saying, look, if, I am, if, if I'm going to use military force to annex Taiwan, I'm going to go in all the way and try to make this a fait accompli. I think that may also be one of the lessons that he's drawing from the Ukraine conflict. So this is not the time for complacency. And, and that, budget, that defense budget was an act of complacency. It was, it was a loud scream of complacency. We're going to shrink our Navy and shrink our budget in real terms. I, I don't get it. I don't get it either, but I'm hauling us all back to the Iran nuclear talks. Um, Jonathan Burks, you had raised your hand. Jump in, jump in here. Yeah, thanks, Mary. I just wanted to pick up on two points that uh, Bridge and Matt had made. You know, I think ultimately what we're trying to, to say is that there's a prioritization that's inherent in strategy. We have to ultimately have a sense of what our core interests are and what risks we're willing to accept in other places because we don't have uh, the resources either under the, the Biden proposed budget or under the budgets that we've had in, in recent years. Um, and given that we're in the window of danger, um, you know, we have to recognize that there's limited resources that are going to be available to us in this window. And you and so, you worked on Capitol Hill, not to interrupt, but just so that our viewers know, and you worked for many years on Capitol Hill, you've seen the sausage get made. Indeed. And I, I bear some responsibility for uh, <laughs> what resources we have available to us today uh, to, to meet the current threat. Um, and so recognizing that, um, you know, to paraphrase what uh, Secretary Rumsfeld had to say once upon a time about you go to army, go to war with the army you have, uh, we have to recognize we're in the period of danger, and therefore we have a, a limited window of resources uh, available to us, and we have to prioritize within that um, within that box. Um, and so bringing us back to Iran, I think that suggests that we have to be more creative about what uh, uh, policies, what tools we have available to us, uh, recognizing that we don't have an infinite uh, tool set available to, to meet um, what is a, a real threat. Um, fortunately, I think we have options. I think we have options in terms of uh, economic policy. We have options in terms of our alliance um, structure, in terms of strengthening the, um, uh, the security, meeting the security needs of, uh, uh, of our partners in the region in other ways. Uh, that allow us to deal with the, the challenge that a nuclear Iran will pose uh, without either having to choose between um, capitulating to, uh, you know, a, a negotiated agreement that essentially uh, blesses uh, their acquisition of a nuclear weapon uh, or saying that the only other alternative is, is going to war. I think there is a, a middle ground uh, that can still be effective. Well, these are very tough issues, and I think it's it's hard to appreciate just how how difficult they are until you're actually in these offices in the executive branch trying to to make decisions that impact people's lives. Christopher Nixon Cox, Christopher Cox Nixon, sorry, I want to come to you um, and just ask you a little bit um, about President Nixon um, and you know these comments that he made. I mean, you know, Secretary Pompeo is right. We just don't hear uh, presidents or national leaders speak as frankly um, about the real state of the world as we we did in these clips. Um, what do you think you would say today as we face not just one, not just two, but potentially multiple crises? Well, I think that what my grandfather would say is, is that we have to be mindful of several of his important rules. One is, is that to project power abroad, we have to first be very strong at home. So, uh, you know, and I'm sorry I joined this conversation uh, a little bit late. Uh, we're just closing a deal. So, <laughs> uh, so, I'm, so I apologize if, if I'm repeating things. But, you know, it's very important that we be strong domestically. And I think that, you know, when we have this crisis in Ukraine, the fact that we're running to Venezuela, we're running to Iran, and, uh, you know, we're begging them for natural resources instead of working on building those resources at home, uh, that just shows a weakness at home which doesn't help us project power abroad. So the first thing I think that he'd say is, is that we have to be very strong at home and focus on that uh, so that we can be stronger abroad. I think that would be one. I think then the second thing is, is that we have to be very mindful of our friends. We can't give more to our enemies than we do to our friends. And I think that in this particular instance, it was touched on by several other people earlier, uh, but the fact that we are giving more to Iran, to Venezuela, to our enemies, so our sworn enemies than we are to our Gulf friends is something I think that it would be a red line for my grandfather. So I think that that's another issue. And then I think the third thing is, is that you always have to be careful to say what you won't do, that you won't use force uh, or you won't put something on the negotiating table. Um, you know, you shouldn't be negotiating against yourself in essence. So always make your adversary get something uh, for 
uh, you know, for everything you take off the table, if you take anything off the table. So I think that he would have a posture that is, uh, you know, much stronger, more challenging to our enemies. And for our friends, uh, he would want to do more for our friends. And in that way, he would build a strong coalition, be strong at home, strong with your friends. And that's the best way to confront, uh, you know, the challenges around the world. And certainly being soft on China and being soft on, uh, you know, on Russia, uh, that's certainly not going to help get a better deal with Iran. And frankly, you know, there's this misnomer that my grandfather, uh, you know, was, was very favorable towards China. He was also very willing to call out China when uh, China made uh, what he thought were uh, egregious mistakes, certainly Tiananmen Square being the best and most prominent example. So, um, you know, I think that it's that willingness to be strong and tough uh, that he would say we need more of our foreign policy today. Fascinating. I wish, wish you were with us. Uh, these are just absolutely fascinating points. You know, uh, Chris, one of the things I've been thinking about is that it's not enough for our enemies to fear us. It's, as you say, our friends also have to like and respect us. And if we're not consistent in our foreign policy, as some of my colleagues here have noticed, um, then it's, it's hard to, to win that trust. And you do see nations like Saudi Arabia saying, hey, maybe we will use the yuan uh, in our energy transactions. That would be incredibly damaging to the United States if we lost that capacity. Um, we are unfortunately running very short on time. Uh, we could talk for hours here uh, on Iran, on Ukraine, on various issues, but I wanted to hand it back over to our co-chair, uh, Secretary Pompeo, for some final thoughts on these Iran nuclear deal negotiations, the idea we delist the IRGC uh, maybe not go through Congress. Mr. Secretary, uh, wrap us up here, please. Well, these points have all been good and well taken, for sure. We should be mindful, too, that they're all connected. Uh, they're connected to the, the, the through lines here between what we've sp spoken about on China and on Iran, our through line with Pyongyang as well, and through lines in Russia. We, we shouldn't forget, too, that if we provide this deal, as I've seen it outlined, for the Iranians, that that money is almost sure to flow straight through uh, the big gap in our sanctions with the Russians. So we will be sitting in Europe, giving the Iranians money and resources that they will use to kill Ukrainian children. Uh, th th this is the challenge when, I, I can't remember who said it before, is if you, if you don't have a deep understanding, a realistic understanding of the things that truly matter, and you haven't prioritized the things that truly matter, then you end up whipsawed when these complexities continue to cascade. And I, I'm afraid this is what we're up against. And I'm afraid our friends can see that too. I don't know that we've ever had a lower moment between the United States and our friends in the Gulf than we're experiencing today. Uh, this is deeply dangerous for the American people. I, I pray that we begin to get it more right. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. But to all you who are watching, we'd love to keep this conversation going in between our monthly seminars, our Participants are active on social media. Please do follow them and the Nixon Foundation. Uh, thank you uh, to Secretary Pompeo, Ambassador O'Brien, our co-chairs, to our seminar members, to the incredible Nixon Foundation team, and for all of you watching, thank you for your time and attention. But that's it for this month's Nixon Seminar on Conservative Realism and National Security. I'm Mary Kissel. Good night.